Hi and welcome to Choose Agape. I'm sorry it's been quite a while since I've had a guest on the show because everybody's been very busy over Christmas, but I'm delighted to welcome today Father Jeffrey Kirby, who is a priest in South Carolina in the US, also senior contributor to Crux News and author of several books and so much more, Marathon Runner, <laughs> all sorts of things. Do you want to just tell us a little bit more about yourself, Father? Yes, yes. So, um, so as you mentioned, I'm a priest here in South Carolina in the United States and uh, was an army brat growing up. So my dad was in the military. I actually grew up in Germany when I was a child. And I went to seminary in Rome and have my a doctorate in world theology. That's really my focus. Uh, recently, Pope Francis named me a papal missionary of mercy. So it's a, a particular task, especially in terms of making confession available. I'm an adjunct professor of theology at Belmont Abbey College, which is our, our local Catholic college here. It's run by the Benedictines. And, and as you mentioned, I, I've written several different books, uh, all of which are born from my pastoral experience. So sometimes when people read some of my books, they say, I feel like you're talking to me, or while well, you answered all of my questions. And, and I smile because those questions have come from other believers in the trenches or from my experience as a pastor, walking with families and believers who want to be faithful to the way of the Lord Jesus. So uh, that's a little bit about me and, and some of my work. Yeah, it's fantastic. I was listening. Uh, I've been listening to your talks on YouTube as well. So your your homilies. So I, I would recommend anybody to go and listen. Exactly as you say, people report. I feel like you're speaking to me. It's just, it's just, you know. Thanks be to God. I loved your recent talk after the death of dear Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, and uh, some of it made me laugh. You were saying your your doctorate. They didn't know whether to give it to you or Pope Benedict. So you have another one because because it was yeah. so rooted in his in his work and the way that you would go from Cardinal Ladaria to to Cardinal uh, Ratzinger and yeah. sort of question one and he'd say, "Well, you go and tell Joseph this," and you go, <laughs> "Yes." So uh, I thought that was lovely. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a loss to the church, but but we we pray and hope that uh, in church glorious he's he continues to to you know pray support help help us in the church militant here uh, as yes. we struggle yes yes I, I say it's our gain in terms of eternity but but really our loss in terms of the battle before us yeah uh, so uh i was actually very surprised by how much uh, his death actually affected me it was a, mm. a real spirit of melancholy uh kind of covered my heart for a couple of days and uh, i think because I, I was able to have those interesting moments with him especially when he was a cardinal before he was pope and i was a seminarian in rome and uh, but also just i think that he was such a, a great gift to the church his clarity of teaching uh his real emphasis on discipleship uh, has very much shaped me and my way of thinking and so as you as you mentioned my <laughs> my review board my doctor is like there's so much joseph ratzinger in this uh, dissertation <laughs> uh, it's either your degree or we're giving him another one so and and they meant it kind of tongue-in-cheek but I, I definitely took it as a compliment yeah, of course, it's a personal loss to you and you knew him. And even my fellow Catholics here have spoken about how they miss him and they feel it really viscerally. You know, it's a real it does feel like a real loss because they, they were so touched in so many conversion stories and reversion stories. I've heard about it was really the writings uh, and the example of Pope Benedict that, that drew people to the truth because everything was truth in love, truth and charity. Yeah, very, very much. And, and, and visited the UK, uh, Pope yeah. Benedict. And, uh, some of his speeches there, especially his speech in uh, Whitehall, where Thomas More, uh, where his trial was contained, um, that's a masterpiece uh, yeah. of, of his teaching. So, uh, yeah, very much, I, I think, touched all of our hearts. But the UK was blessed with one of his actual pastoral visits. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we were. I, I'm a Catholic voice here, which was set up in because the narrative around Pope Benedict was quite negative and, and false. And so it was set up to try and sort of speak uh, the truth in the culture. And it still goes on today. So they have Catholics speaking in, in, in the media about uh, some of these hot button issues, as it were. But yes, what, what happened, of course, was he visited and all this negativity fell away as they realised there was this outpouring of love. Um, yeah. It's just beautiful. And he spoke, as you said, really, really profound, really beautiful and, and gentle, a real gentleman. Yes, yeah. very much, very much. So you, you've talked about the battle and we know that we're in one. Um, <clears throat> at this point, I have to say, uh, this book that you've written, Sanctify Them in Truth, you'll see it's full of um, my underlining and my and my <laughs> and my um, highlighting because I return to it often. And I would recommend any Catholic, especially a Catholic 
person struggling to know how to navigate the, the the difficult issues that we face today that this is this is such clarity which we often don't get it's a beautiful book and and you say it's it's uh the church's social doctrine how we address the issues of issues of our time what is the social doctrine of the church yeah sure so first it's, it's good to emphasize that there, there is a social doctrine and and oftentimes that can catch catholics off guard and and it's important to emphasize that you know, the church provides guidance and teachings in, in all the areas that we encounter in life. You know, one of the reasons why we have a magisterium, a, a teaching authority, is that it interprets and applies the teachings of Christ to our contemporary lives. So things that the Lord never spoke about himself, the church takes his teachings and apply them to these issues of our day. So the social doctrine is when the church takes the dogmatic teachings of Christ and applies them to contemporary issues and says, okay, Here's how the teachings of Christ, our theological tradition, applies to this uh, specific issue, this moral issue, this social issue. So social, social doctrine is very important. I know a lot of times people will rally around social justice or the works of mercy, which is wonderful. We need to do that. But oftentimes they can forget that there's actually, actually a doctrine behind that. So we might hear a lot about the social action of the church, but we need to just as much hear about the social doctrine, what are her teachings, the church's teachings, in terms of these issues yeah exactly what's it rooted in because it sometimes it's presented as an either or isn't it it's either you're compassionate and kind but you don't have to worry about dogma or doctrine or you're worried about dogma and you're not you don't care about people but in fact they necessarily go hand in hand are uh, the reason we are compassionate the reason we reach out to the poor to those in need is because we we have this rich this te this this call from christ and then it's yeah. elucidated by the church. It's made clear what it is that we're we're called to do and who who we're called to be. Very much, as you said earlier, it's love and truth. Yeah. And ultimately, we see them fulfilled love and truth within the life of the Trinity. Yeah. So the yeah. Trinity is about truth and about relationship and about love. And so we're made in the image of of the Triune God. And as His children, we're called to to reflect both truth but also love. And Saint Paul emphasizes that in his teachings. He says, you know, "Speak the truth in love." Right. So, uh, you know, don't be silent, but also, you know, don't don't be a jerk about it, you know, so yeah. I speak the truth in love. Yeah, it is hard, though, Father, isn't it? I, I mean, it, it, I think it's I don't know if it's always been this way. Um, I'm the tender age of 46, <laughs> but so I'm post Vatican II. Um, it seems to me sometimes like we, we, we have these. I, I never like this term, this idea of wings of the church, you know, that you're on this side, you're progressive or you're. Uh, conservative and I think this isn't helpful language because there shouldn't be wings it's 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 catholic we're one holy catholic and apostolic church um but having said that there are we are sometimes present sometimes it's so I'm going to ask your advice on this it's difficult because sometimes we have ambiguity and yes. and we we look for clarity and then so I have found with fellow catholics and we're discussing matters in the church sometimes there's been um, criticism of of the way in which Pope Francis has spoken or, or some of the bishops and then it's always this awkward situation where people say you call yourself Catholic and you're criticizing the Pope how and of course we we love our Holy Father and we pray for our Holy Father um, but is how does one navigate when as pe lay people catechists there's ambiguity there's confusion sometimes um, but at the same time we, we respect and we honor our our Holy Father and and the bishops it's a difficult. Yes, sir. Yeah, sure. So, so actually, we were speaking about Pope Benedict. Let me um, bring in some of his teachings that can help us in this area. So, you know, the terms, uh, you know, liberal or conservative and various other designations, um, Pope Benedict reminds us that these are actually political terms. So whenever we allow these terms to be used in the church, we are allowing for a politicalization of the gospel. So we are introducing something that's not part of our treasury, not part of our teaching, a whole new language, conservative, liberal, and so on. And what Pope Benedict wanted to do is he said, let's get rid of these terms and place everything back in the context of discipleship. So we are called to follow the way of the Lord Jesus. The Lord calls, we answer. He calls us to do something, and we choose to follow him, uh, what St. Paul calls the obedience of faith. So for Pope Benedict, he puts it back in the biblical model, and he says, really, the question is really, one of obedience or dissension. So I'm either going to dissent and say, I will not obey, I will not do what the Lord tells me, or I will obey, I'm going to do what the Lord asks of me. So first, just, I very much appreciated uh, that context of 
let's remove the political terms and instead put it in, put it in biblical terms. Yeah. This is about discipleship, about following the Lord Jesus. Are we going to be faithful? Now, once we understand that, uh, to, to your uh, latter question, is that, well, what happens then when we hear leaders of the church, perhaps even the Holy Father, uh, say things that are uh, unsettling or appear to be inconsistent with aspects of our tradition? Well, one thing I always tell people, and this is part of being a trained theologian, is what is the context in which the leader of the church, a bishop or the Holy Father, is teaching? So, for example, if he's giving an interview to a news outlet, that has no magisterial authority whatsoever, right? So yeah. let me give the application to Pope Benedict. When he wrote the three volumes on the life of Jesus, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, volumes one, two, three, he says at the beginning, I'm not writing this as the Holy Father. I'm writing this as a theologian. I welcome criticism of this work, right? Because it, it has no magisterial authority. Someone can't say, oh, you can't say that because Pope Benedict says in volume three, so-and-so, as if it's a magisterial uh, right. teaching has magisterial weight. It does not. So the first question is, how is this church leader speaking? And a lot of times what happens is with the Holy Father, we hear interviews, right? On the airplane or with some news outlet. And he's just expressing his personal <clears throat> opinion. And sometimes that could be unsettling because... We would hope that the personal opinions of the shepherds would always reflect and reaffirm the church's teachings, right? But sometimes there might be nuances or other aspects that uh, maybe we don't fully understand. But I would say first is, what is the context in terms of the teaching? And then secondly is, uh, when it is magisterial, what is the weight in which it is binding on us? So, for example, you know, the Holy Father has a lot of opinions on climate and climate change and so on, right? Well, the church has no authority in the realms of the natural sciences. So the Holy Father can have an opinion, he can teach, but he cannot bind our consciences in these matters because it's beyond faith and morals. So I would say first we want to clarify, and then sometimes we just have to say there are times in which we realize as we hear in Acts of the Apostles, uh, the Lord chose the apostles who were bruised, broken, and imperfect men. And the Catechism reemphasizes that, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and says, you know, these men have been called to their vocations. Uh, they still struggle with their own sinfulness and their own questions and so on, uh, just as we all do with our baptism. We've been baptized in Christ, consecrated to Jesus Christ, and yet we still struggle with our own thoughts, our own obedience of faith, our own understanding. So I think that sometimes we just see some, some of the brokenness of our fallen humanity playing itself out, including in the lives of our spiritual fathers. So I think these various distinctions can help uh, in terms of approaching this. And the unbeliever always like to throw things in our face. Well, your Pope, your Pope says, and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, you know, suddenly they're listening to the Pope. It's like, well, if you're going to listen to the Pope, the first thing he says is Jesus Christ is Lord. So how about we start there? And then we find out all the other stuff he might say. That's a very good point. If you're gonna if you're gonna start quoting the Pope, here you go. <laughs> <Read it. Yeah. laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's lovely. Um, it's true. I think I think the other thing is it's it's making that distinction between so when you speak about the truth, when you speak about Christ, when you speak about these issues in your book, um, when you stand up for human life, when you do uh, some people say, Oh, you think you're so perfect. And mm -hmm. so we always have to say that that isn't what I'm saying. There's a difference between um aiming right recognizes there's an aim falling short as we all do but recognizing the aim and then totally getting rid of it completely so i think yeah. i think that's what we have to try and emphasize as well is that we're not coming from a place of um you know we think we're wonderful and you're not we're all sinners of course yes. of course but we know that in christ that we ha he will bring us to this this freedom and this truth if we assent as you say, but, but it's, it's like this, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, actually, just, just to be able to say that there's right and wrong and that there's truth. So we know we're fallen and we know we're sinful because we have a gauge, a standard in which we know that we have not yet met, right? Mm. We know grace can make it possible working within us, but exactly, we know right and wrong. We know what truth is. But you know, even that's a controversial statement now. We well, are told we live in a post-truth world. It's like, what does that mean? <laughs> I know. Well, that's a worrying thing, because I think as long as you know that there's this aim, there's this standard that we that we direct ourselves towards, then then that's something you can it's like you can navigate. You, you realize there's a purpose to your life. But if you just get rid of it altogether, then we're 
chaos. It's absolute chaos. And that's what we're seeing now is you can't even make statements, very obvious statements about the complementarity of the sexes that God created us, male and female. These are controversial statements. I, I don't know. How, <laughs> I don't know how we got here, but it, that 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 that's controversial is surprising. Yes, exactly. And, and and you know, we look at it, and, and this is rudimentary anthropology. Yeah. Basic observation, and to your point, this has now become controversial. Yeah. Like, and it becomes difficult to to speak in in our you know post truth world. We are told. Mm -hmm. and, and yet as Christians, we know that there is a way, there is right and wrong. We know there is a complementary uh, complementarity of the genders. We know that there is a proper purpose for our sexual powers. Uh, we know there is a uh, truth that has to limit and, 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 and mature love and a love that has to tenderize truth. We know all these things because they've been given to us. And, and as, you, as you emphasize, and I want to stress, uh, we are all mutually yoked under our fallen human nature. Yeah. And with the call of the gospel to see constantly to try to live up to this. Uh, but the good thing about our life as Christians is we know where we're going. We know what our goal is. We know right and wrong. I think that's the gift we can give to our neighbors. And in their human nature, because of the natural law in our human hearts, it, it resonates. In fact, sometimes I think people get upset because when we speak truth, it resonates with what's inside them. And they know that there's something right that's being said, but they don't want to accept it. Yeah. And of course, that becomes our task as Christians to to speak the truth in love and, and at times sometimes to, to bear the cross of our neighbors and, and sometimes a little bit of persecution that comes with it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, I've worked with young people a lot and they're absolutely desperate for truth. And in my own my own story is one of falling away from the faith quite far in my 20s and then coming back and actually I didn't like it. I was annoyed. Who are you to tell me this? But But there was something in me obviously as a creature of god that recognized that actually this was true and i was i didn't i didn't like it i didn't want to hear it but i recognized it was true so i think it that's a lesson in perseverance in truth and love because it is in all of us to recognize it even though it's become very cloudy um, yes. uh, and it's life you know once once you let christ in and he transforms your life it's 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 a whole new it's a whole new life it's a whole new existence and i think mm -hmm. people are so desperate for it Yes. Amen. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you say in your book, Christian believers have been silent and passive for too long and need to find their voice. Why do you think they've been silent and how might they find their voice? Your book will help. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, yes. I, I think that what, what has happened is uh, we have all fallen into uh, the respectability of our age. Mm -hmm. And so we can forget that you know, 20 years ago, certainly 40 years ago, 60 years ago, it was uh, very acceptable to follow the Lord Jesus, to follow Christian morality, to uh, speak openly about a life of prayer and so on in the spiritual matters. And, and all that began to, to fade away as, as the West has more and more kind of removed itself from its Christian foundation, which means the Christian message or the way of life hasn't changed, but the culture around it has changed. And so what was completely culturally acceptable 20, 40, 60 years ago now becomes very controversial. So to speak about Jesus Christ in public can, can make people sneer at you or mock you or tell you to be quiet or to speak about prayer or moral truth uh, can, can definitely not only get you silenced, but even called horrible names. So our task as Christians has not changed. Again, the culture around us has changed, which means now it becomes a real test in terms of what we really believe. So if we fall into the respectability of the culture, then we're going to be quiet. We're not going to say things. We don't want our neighbors to think we're weird. We don't want to be called names and so on. So I think the respectability is, is one aspect. I also think that there's been this real push to privatize religion. Right. And, and which is the death of religion, because especially the Christian faith, because the whole purpose, especially of, of Christianity is for the disciples of the Lord to share the good news that has been given. So if we're called to go and to make all, make disciples of all nations, to share the good news and, and, and to serve the poor, the sick, the suffering, but then we're told, no, 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 you need to keep that in your home or you need to keep that in your house of worship. Well, that's a really indirect way of killing the Christian faith, but it's strong. And, and there are believers who've accepted that. Well, I believe in Jesus. I, I, I believe in the church. I, I go to, to worship. I you know, I, I pray in my home, but they would never imagine speaking about Jesus at work or having some type of prayer in public or 
addressing moral goodness or moral evil in their neighborhoods. So again, we have this both this respectability, but also this privatization that mm -hmm. has led to Christian believers losing their their voices and their backbones. Mm, yeah, it's, that's very true, actually. I think people are frightened. They see it as a private matter and they don't want to. And also, we, we're very much a culture of not wanting to offend. I don't want to offend anybody. I want to be nice. And nice has somehow trumped truth. It's, it's, it's good to be nice, but not at the expense of what's true. That's and right. so now I think we go around and we're so worried about hurting people's feelings that, as you say, we just, what, what do we become? We've got nothing to offer. Yes. And the problem is, if we don't have an anchor, like if we, the church is an anchor in the waves, you know, one homosexuality might be a, a crime 50 years ago and the church will stand up for those homosexuals being killed. And now it might be perfectly fine. But either way, the church is it's not beholden to what's popular at the time. And, and we should be glad of that. People should be glad of that because it won't sway with whatever happens to be, you yeah. know, in vogue. Exactly. So in the United States, uh, the civil rights movement in the 1960s, uh, what motivated the Christian leaders to do that is mm -hmm. the same principle, the same consistent message that leads us to defend the unborn. Yeah. So for us, it doesn't change as you're, as you're stressing as our, our message, our beliefs haven't changed. The culture changes. So we have to defend the equality of races several decades ago. Now we have to defend the life of the unborn. It's the same message. The culture changes. Oh, no, no, that was good, you know, to do a couple decades ago with the civil rights movement. But no, no, no. But it's okay to take the lives of the unborn. It's like, well, wait a minute, if all life is equal and all life has dignity, as we believe as Christians and all people of goodwill can realize <clears throat> that it's the same message that has to be consistently applied. Yeah. Was it Chesterton who said, I'm going to mangle this, something like that? We want a church that will move us. Not, we don't want to move. Yeah. Uh, and I'll tell you what Pope Benedict, he says that if the church marries herself to one age, yeah. she becomes a widow in the next. Yeah. And, and so we cannot, our, our truths belong, do not belong to one culture or one age. Yeah, so true. Very profound and right. Uh, to your book, um, you talked about the preeminence of human life. Um, how did you decide, and other issues, how did you decide what issues to focus on for the book? And can you just tell us a bit about how it's structured? Because I find it really helpful, very readable, accessible. So how did you decide? Yeah, yeah. so, so um, as I mentioned, I'm a pastor and um, so... My parishioners reached out to me. I have a lot of young families, and they reached out. They said, you know, Father, can you please help us? Um, we're being told that, you know, abortion is just one of many moral issues, and we can't be overly obsessed with abortion and or, you know, immigration or, or the LGBTQ plus movement or so on. So really, it was my parishioners and, and people reaching out to me and saying, please, can you address this? Please give us some guidance or teaching. So that was part of it. And then I, I did some basic research online. I just Googled. I said major issues facing Americans so in the United States, right? You know, and, and obviously these issues apply to every country and so on. So I just did a little bit of research, um, drew from emails I was re receiving from parishioners, and then drafted a list of several moral issues uh, in, in, in the day. And that started, that, that whole approach started as a homily series. So I, I just did that as a homily, a series of homilies on different moral issues. And there was such a response that uh, a whole adult formation program followed. And, and if you can just imagine about 300 Catholic adults coming every Wednesday night to hear about our faith. Now, that should be normal, but we know that's extraordinary, right? We just don't get that, numbers, that number of people to come for adult formation. But they did, and they came and they asked questions and they posed challenges and so on. It was great because they adjusted the presentation and they reminded me or, or showed me I need to add some things or, or develop some things. And then from there, eventually I had all these notes. And I said, well, let me see if this book can be of help to other Catholics beyond my parish. Uh, I reached out to a publisher and they said, we're willing to, to, to look at something and then brought it all together. So again, if people read the parts of the chapter and they say, wow, like he, he addressed all the parts, like I was waiting for one part and then it was there and then another and it was already there. <laughs> And so on, and, and and I understand this, and it's readable, and I can understand what he's saying. And this isn't, you know, way developed, uh, you know, high flute theology or something, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I, I get this. Um, I, I want to stress this because it has come from other believers, other families, who are in the exact same trenches, who are fighting the same fight. 
and we're asking for guidance. So that's how it developed. And when I approached the book, I, I wanted to make sure that that the book, each chapter helped. It wasn't simply, here's what the church says and good luck. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so each chapter starts with, it begins with some virtues and some mm -hmm. principles from our social doctrine. Because if, if we don't understand what we mean by our virtues, love, hope, and so on, if we don't understand our principles, then what we do is we end up arguing divine truth based on secular definitions. Because the secular world has redefined all of our world, all of our words, freedom, love, hope, they've all been redefined. So the first thing that had to be done is here's how we understand them. And I quote the catechism. These are not my definitions. Yeah. So I quote the catechism. Uh, here's our, here are some virtues. Here are some principles from our social doctrine. So <clears throat> I call that kind of the setup. We're getting ready, you know. Yeah. And then there's the whole part on the specific issue. And I try to give pastoral stories and applications. I try to break down terms. I try to be, again, make it as readable, as digestible as possible. And then very importantly, each chapter concludes with a spiritual component. Yeah. Because we're not in a battle just to be right. We're in an engagement because we want to share the good news that has been given to us. We, we love our neighbors. We're called to be good Samaritans. We want to share the good news with our, our neighbors. We want them to have the abundant life of Jesus Christ as, as it has been given to us. So we conclude each chapter with spiritual parts, so an examination of conscience. We don't want to be self-righteous. And then some prayers that we can offer for ourselves and those that we might speak to. So those are that's the kind of breakdown of each chapter. Yeah, well, it's it's really very, very helpful. Um, as I say, I turn to it often. I also watch your homilies online. So you've got a you've certainly got an audience of one and I'm sure many more in the UK <laughs> and hopefully many more after after I share this with others but um but father honestly thank you so much for for your time and and for this book and uh, the other books that you've written i think the work that you're doing is wonderful and i'm so grateful and i hope we continue to pray for one another as we do what little we can what little i can to to reach out um in this in this battle in this spiritual battle in the culture to speak yeah. the truth in love Yes, amen, amen. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk and, and for your good work. And I, I hope the book helps people. Uh, sometimes we don't speak the truth because we feel that we don't have the answers or we don't feel that we are, are formed well enough. Uh, but hopefully this book can help. Yeah, I think that's definitely something else to emphasize is you don't have to wait till you're perfect because you'll be waiting a while. <laughs> so we just ask for God's grace. We, we continue to... to um attend the sacraments and just ask God and as we did before we began today to pray and to say guide me uh, let me be your vessel and to do to do your work so Peter Crave says uh it, God always uses strange vehicles to do his holy work just look at the donkey going into Jerusalem yes <laughs> amen <laughs> anyway thank you so much father and I hope perhaps we'll speak again thank you God bless you God bless bye-bye